Good afternoon. Special welcome to Trinity if you're a guest or visitor with us today. Because today, as you know, we celebrate something special. We celebrate the use of Pastor Schmitzer as our Lord has used him over 40 years here at Trinity and also throughout our city. Our service is projected for you and it's also printed for you in your bulletin today. May God bless our worship as we sing our opening hymn. has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. For his sake, he removes your sin and guilt forever. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and in his place and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us praise the Lord.
Merciful Lord, cast the bright beams of your light on all your people, that being instructed by the faithful teachers of your church, we may always walk in the light of your saving truth, until at last we inherit that gift of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. At this time, we give our attention to God's words as they have been recorded for us in the pages of Holy Scripture, which has also been the focus of the last 40 years of service by Pastor Schmitzer. Our first lesson for today comes from Isaiah 52. It serves as the basis for the sermon later. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. The Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue with an anthem by the choir.
Our second lesson for this afternoon comes from Ephesians chapter 4. And here we see how the Lord uses Christians in all sorts of ways to proclaim his word. And specifically we hear about some of those called positions. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting movement, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Alleluia. Please stand for the Gospel of our Lord. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 19. As we hear these verses in this parable, it might have somewhat of a, a strange ending for an anniversary service, but I think you all will answer that you know how your pastor has served you over all these years. He's been a faithful servant. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant. His master replied, Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mind. I have, it kept, I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you, because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, Take his mind away with him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our next hymn. Grace and peace are yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
The sermon text for our meditation this afternoon was our first lesson from Isaiah chapter 52, which was read before, and I'll be emphasizing certain parts of it, reading through portions of it during the sermon. Dear people of the Lord, the great King over all the earth, let me direct your attention to the uh, video screen in front of you there for a moment. This may not be a surprise to you if you've ever seen my dad outside in the summer barefoot or in sandals, but those are not my dad's feet. <laughs> no, those pedicured, scrubbed, exfoliated feet belong to some foot model somewhere who, would you believe it, probably gets paid for people to take pictures of their feet. I don't know that many people that are that fond of their feet that they would ever want to see them up on a big screen like that, let alone have people pay to take pictures of them and use them, my goodness, in sermon illustrations, for heaven's sakes. But can you imagine having a job like a foot model where people would actually look at your feet and say, how beautiful. What if, what if you had a job where the Lord of heaven and earth himself looked at your feet and said, how beautiful. He never lies. He never flatters. He always tells the truth. And today we see in these verses that our Lord says very clearly, Pastor Schmitzer has beautiful feet. Isaiah begins this section talking about the feet of people like Pastor Schmitzer. He says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. I'm guessing that most of you here today have read through these verses many times on your own, heard them read here in church. But have you stopped to think for a moment at what an oxymoron we have in these verses? An oxymoron, to remember your English phrase, is, is a phrase where you take contradicting words and, and smush them together. Words, phrases like jumbo shrimp, or original copy, or random order. Beautiful feet. Beautiful feet of a messenger running through the mountains of Israel? Just think about what running through the mountains in sandals would do to your feet. Most people would probably take one look at those messengers' feet, plug their noses, and say, those are not beautiful feet. Remember Jesus on the, the night that he celebrated the Lord's Supper in the upper room with his disciples. He was the one who took off his outer robe, put the towel around his waist, bent down, grabbed a, a basin of water, and washed his disciples' feet. It was such a, a marked object lesson because that was the job of the lowest servant, a job that nobody really wanted to have. It was not a prized uh, duty as a servant because the people of Israel and Jesus, they did not have feet that looked like that. They wore sandals that were pieces of leather strapped to their feet with leather thongs, and as they walked through the dusty streets of Israel, those sweaty, hot, dusty feet would get absolutely horrid. And then add the, the fact that Isaiah says he's talking about a messenger who's bringing a message across the mountains. Probably not someone who was walking on some of those smooth Roman roads with the smooth paved stones. The feet of a messenger would be bruised and battered after traveling across those rocky mountains and the narrow paths. An experienced herald who had spent many days on the roads delivering many messages would have tough, weathered feet covered with calluses. And certainly after 40 years of being a messenger, we would all take a look at those feet and we would say, those are not beautiful feet. But God has a way of calling things that are not as though they are. He says, those feet are beautiful, not because of the way that they look, but because of the message that they bring. They tirelessly carry a message, Isaiah says, of peace, good.
good tidings and salvation. And I got to tell you, as I was preparing for this sermon, this word salvation jumped out of me. We can do a little Hebrew word study here. The word used here for salvation is Yeshua in the original Hebrew. Have you heard that word before? Is there anyone here named Joshua? Does anyone know what the name Joshua means? The Lord saves, right? And the name Joshua is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek name Jesus. Remember, before Jesus was born, the angel Gabriel said to Joseph, you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 700 years before God sent his son, the prophet Isaiah wrote, How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim Yeshua, who proclaim Jesus. And that's what your pastor has done. For the past 32 years here in Genera, and before that in his other positions in ministry, Pastor Schmitzer has proclaimed Jesus. Whether it was right here in this pulpit, downstairs teaching Bible class, over at school teaching catechism class or Bible information classes, in the homes of the members of Trinity, in nursing homes, in the hospital, in prison cells, he proclaimed Jesus. Here in church, in public absolution, as he announced to you the forgiveness of your sins as he performed baptism or distributed the Lord's Supper, whether he was sharing the law to lead sinners to repentance or sharing the gospel to bring the wonderful comfort of forgiveness, the purpose was always the same. The purpose was always to proclaim Jesus. The good news of Jesus' death and resurrection brings comfort to God's people. God has redeemed his people with the precious blood of Jesus spilled for us on the cross and for faithfully proclaiming Jesus as a pastor for 40 years, our Lord says of those feet, those are beautiful feet. But it's not just pastors that Isaiah was talking about. Because it's not just pastors who proclaim Jesus as the Savior of the world. All of us, every single one of us here, has been given the Great Commission. All of us have important roles and duties to perform in the mission to make disciples of all nations. Now, your duties may not include standing up in front of a group of 200 people on Sunday morning, to proclaim the good news of Jesus, but yours might be running the video recorder so that other people who are not with us here today can hear the good news of Jesus. Your role might be to print the bulletins so that we can have worship services and speak God's word together. Your role might be counting the offerings or singing in the choir. Your role could be as simple as sharing the video of your worship service here at Trinity with a friend or a colleague or a co-worker so that they also can hear about Jesus as their Savior. Your role in proclaiming Jesus can include or should include proclaiming Jesus regularly in your family, leading your family in prayer, your spouse in family devotions at home, and bringing your children to hear about Jesus at church and Sunday school and your Christian day school. Teaching your children to sing, your grandchildren to sing, I am Jesus, little lamb. God has blessed all of us with a role to play, praying for our church's missions and supporting them with your offerings, sending pastors and teachers and missionaries around the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus. But too often, we're guilty of treating those roles, those God-given roles, as questionable. Or at least, let's say, as not 
the most beautiful thing, the most desired thing in the entire world. We regularly think and act as though proclaiming Jesus is not what makes something the most beautiful or wonderful. We feel like proclaiming Jesus brings too many problems for us to bother. It's, it's outside of our comfort zone. It might bring you rejection from your family or your co-workers, from a neighbor or from a friend. Sadly, we are guilty of not treating the proclamation of the gospel and the study of God's word for our own good as the most beautiful and most important thing in our lives. And I know that because even pastors feel that way at times. Too often, we all feel like something as unimportant as, that we don't have time for something as unimportant as proclaiming God's word to ourselves or to others. And because we regard sharing the good news of salvation as less than prime importance in our lives, we miss out. We miss out on the joy that Isaiah is talking about in these verses, the joy that these people experience at hearing and then once again proclaiming the good news of Jesus. God has called all of us to the important job of sharing salvation with the world and bringing up our children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Even though we have sadly avoided or complained about this important task or not rejoiced in it, as the Lord shows us in these verses, God still forgives us through Jesus' blood. He sent you a pastor to proclaim to you the good news of the forgiveness for all of your sins. And not just Pastor Schmitzer. Thinking back over the past 32 years here in Genera, there are other Servants that the Lord has sent you here at Trinity, and it was kind of amusing to think back through them. Vicar Ship, um, Vicar Schrader, there it was. Vicar Nitz, Vicar Panning, Vicar Schrader, Pastor Raditz, Pastor Henning, Pastor Bulwark, and now Pastor Novon. Because Jesus has taken away all of your sins, God now looks at you. And he says, your feet are beautiful. Go and be my heralds and proclaim the good news of Jesus to all the world. And if God says that someone's feet are beautiful, he clearly intends that we understand the entire person is beautiful in his eyes. And he wants us to see that person and what they say and what they do as beautiful and valuable and treasured too. And that's why all of you are here today. Not because you like 4 o'clock church service better than 10.30 church service, but because to you, this herald of good news is beautiful and precious. A treasured friend. Someone in whom you want to give thanks to the Lord. Someone for whom you Praise God. And it's because of God's blessing to Pastor Schmitzer that he has had the privilege and the joy of sharing the gospel with you these 32 years here at Trinity. 2,500 years ago, the name Marathon was just the name of a coastal town in Greece. In 490 BC, it was the place where the Greek army, especially the Athenians, fought against the invading Persian army. Even though there were many warriors who fought in that battle, not many have had their names recorded on the pages of history. But the story is told of one Greek soldier named Phidippides who fought there at the Battle of Marathon. Actually, very little is told about his fighting as a warrior but what is remembered about him is that after the battle was over, the people of Athens were waiting back in the city, which was about 26 miles away from the plains around Marathon where the battle was going on. And when the war was over, the outcome was decided. Phidippides ran those 26 miles, which is where we get the length of a marathon, 
back to the city of Athens to deliver the news. The word that he spoke, according to the legends, is Nenike Kamen, which means we have won. Presumably it's where we get the brand name Nike from. The story goes on that after delivering this simple but joyful message, Pheidippides died of exhaustion. However, the people of Athens hailed him as their hero. They viewed him with respect and honor because he had brought them the joyful news of victory. Today we give thanks to God and honor a servant for bringing us the joyful news of victory. Jesus won the victory for us. He defeated sin, death, and the devil. And because that news is so wonderful to hear, because it brings us such joy, we will give thanks all our lives for the messengers that God has sent to share that good news with us. And after 40 years of ministry have been completed, after the Schmitzers have moved away from Genera, we trust in God's faithfulness that he will continue to proclaim his gospel in this place through many messengers, through Pastor Nova and your called workers, your teachers here at school, but also through every single one of you, especially the members of Trinity Lutheran Church. Every day that God gives you on this green earth the most important, the most beautiful, the most wonderful, Thing that you can do is share the good news of peace, good tidings, and salvation with someone that God has put in your life. Through us, all the ends of the earth will hear of the salvation of our God. Until we see each other again in our Heavenly Father's kingdom of above, giving thanks for the joyous privilege of being His messengers. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue on page 8 in your bulletins as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of life, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as we speak responsibly the prayer of the church on the bottom of page 8. Eternal Father, ever-living and everlasting Lord, in Christ Jesus, you call us your children and invite us to bring our prayers to you with a steady trust that you will answer them. O Lord, hear our prayer. We praise you and give you our thanks for pouring out your blessings for so many years on your servant, Pastor Schnitzer, and for calling him into the public ministry of the gospel. To you, we give thanks. You gave him a heart of faith through baptism and strengthen him with your word and holy sacrament. You empowered him to rely on your grace and guidance, instilled in him a deep love for your scriptures, and endowed him with compassion for the lost and a commitment to his labor. And with these gifts, you have granted victories to your gospel and blessings to your church. To you be the praise. Now, we pray that you would continue to use your servant according to your will and ways. Give him opportunities to share his wisdom with everyone around him. Protect him from trouble. Keep his family under the shadow of your wings. 
and give him joy as he pursues the labors of each day. O Lord, hear our prayer. Raise up, O Lord, from the ranks of your church another generation of men who are willing and eager to carry the torch of your gospel into the world. And with the proclamation of that message of grace, bring into your fold many more and add them to the dignity and destiny of your elect. O Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Give to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above, that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people. 
Send your Holy Spirit to your people's hearts through that means of grace so that they may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your holy name to the end of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.